Dr. Oler, thank you very much. You're the director of the Office of Minor Use and Minor Species Animal Drug Development in the Center for Veterinary Medicine. That's right. Besides being a mouthful, you probably get the prize for having the longest name of an office, but what does it do? Okay, our office is a very small office. Our whole staff is only three and a half people. Um, Therefore, minor use and minor species. Right, which is really ironic because minor species are all species, this is actually in the statute, that aren't major species. So that's not too helpful on its own until you know that there are seven major species. So that's horses, cows, pigs, dogs, cats, chickens, and turkeys. Everything else is minor. So we have aquaculture, we have zoo animals, we have lab animals, we have game birds, sheep, goats, llamas, everything. All of the stuff in the zoo on from aardvarks to zebras. So including honeybees and many, many animals of agricultural importance and a lot of companion animals like ferrets and hamsters and pet birds and aquarium fish. All of those things are there and they're valuable and they're important to people personally and they're important to our economy but they're not economically worth it for a pharmaceutical company to get a drug approved for them. So your office is concerned with drug development for those species? Yes. So those species and, and I guess uh, drugs that, that have, have limited distribution, limited use? Well it's a lot like the orphan drug program for people. It's uh, as I said, it's not really worth it to a pharmaceutical company for a market of how many sick llamas are there. The drug approval process is time consuming and it's expensive and they need a good market to make their money back. So our office it largely manages incentive programs for the pharmaceutical companies. We've been talking to um, some veterinarians that work with the circus and we're looking at some drugs for elephants but they're not ready yet. Um, most of the work that we've got done that's been successful has been, as I said, with these sort of orphan drug incentives, giving extended marketing exclusivity. We have a grants program now for uses that the pharmaceutical company will get approved, working usually in partnership with someone like the USDA's Minor Use Animal Drug Program or um, some public hatcheries with U.S. Geological Survey, with U.S. Fish and Wildlife Survey. So there is taxpayer money going to do the studies in a lot of these cases. But then the companies are able to come in with their own manufacturing and their labeling and use the research data to get the drugs approved through the regular process. So that's how we work at the incentive side of it. Some of the things that we have done recently working with the USDA's program, we've got a couple drugs approved for American fowl brood and honeybees. What does that mean? What is that? It's a disease that affects the larval bees, mm -hmm. and so we have some antibiotics that we've gotten approved so that we can treat the bees outside of the time when they're making honey, and they are able to take care of, uh, cure this disease in the larvae. Mm -hmm. And you may have heard in the news a lot lately that honeybees are kind of having a bad time, so anything we can do to help them out is really important because they have billions of dollars worth of impact on our agriculture. So we've been working on drugs for honeybees, we've been working on drugs for sheep, we've been working with... Uh, What's the problem with sheep? Well, some of the things we've done for sheep are respiratory disease, anti antibiotics. We also have worked on a, some, a drug that helps, it's a hormone that helps synchronize breeding so that the farmers aren't up day and night for months while with lambing. They can synchronize and have the lambs pretty much at the same time. Um, and also at different, when it's a little warmer sometimes. It can shift things around a little bit, gives them more control. Uh, we have work going on for pheasants with um, gape worm and uh, some coccidia dis diseases that are, they're parasites. Mm -hmm. In, uh, we have pheasants, partridges, and quail that we're all working on all of those. We have work um, going on for goats and with sheep and goats, it's usually respiratory disease or foot rot or, or something like that. The way that it often works is that the pharmaceutical company will have a drug that's approved for cattle, and then it's not really worth their while to do the sheep and goats, but with the help from the USDA's program, we get the research done so that we can then get an approval right through the regular process for the to supplement their existing cattle label with sheep and goats. Well, I bet that most people don't realize that the FDA is involved with this at all, that what, if they go on a farm or if they go on a supermarket and see the results of what goes on on the farm, or if they go to the zoo, 
that the FDA has a, has a, has a firm role in all of this. That's true. And it is kind of a thing, people sometimes think that we actually conduct the studies and have the animals in our building, which we don't. But we work in partnership with uh, universities, with the pharmaceutical companies, with contract research labs who are actually doing the studies to show that these drugs are safe to the animal, safe to the people who are using, administering the drug to the animal, safe if it's a food producing animal, that if it's a goat, we have to make sure that the milk is safe, we have to make sure meat is safe. If it's uh, uh, poultry of any kind that's not chickens and turkeys, we have to worry about eggs and we have to worry about the meat as well. So the, uh, human food safety, we're also concerned about antimicrobial resistance issues where we don't want antibiotics to be overused in animals on the farm. So we have to make sure that we, we demonstrate that all of these things are safe in all of, if used according to label directions. And it's also important that we get these drugs approved rather than use them under an extra label provision, which is legal in almost all cases. Um, but it's not as good because we don't have established withdrawal times. We don't have established uh, dosage regimens for the species that it's intended for. So it's much better to get the drugs approved and anything that we can do to facilitate that, we really want to do. And there are more and more exotic species that are kept in, in confined spaces, so it's really important that they be as healthy as they possibly can uh, yes. to preserve those species. Right, and I'm a veterinarian, and I know lots of veterinarians who have expanded their practices into um, exotic birds and reptiles and the pocket pets and the ferrets and all the things that back in the old days when I started veterinary schools, it was mostly, you know, farm animals and dogs and cats. But we have a lot of these animals that people have in their homes now and there's virtually nothing approved for them. And as I said, there is legal extra label use, but it's often not in the proper formulation for those animals or it's often they don't know what the dosing should be. So it's really, really good that we can get companies to work with us and get these drugs either approved or indexed if it's a non-food minor species. and. Um, we have, as I said, the incentives to do it, and we have the cooperating programs, our partners with USDA and universities and other government agencies to try and get these studies done. I see in your face and hear in your voice a certain excitement about what you do. Uh, what's the source of that excitement? Well, I do like to say that I really think we are making a difference. You know, it's being a bureaucrat is not exactly the same as I used to be a horse doctor. I used to go out and uh, be on the farms all the time. and to go in and, and suddenly have an office job I thought was going to be fairly deadly, but it turned out that it's never boring. Every time the phone rings, it's somebody who wants to get something approved to deal with cattle fever ticks, in, which is a minor use in a major species down in Texas, or it's somebody who wants to get something approved for honeybees, or it's someone who wants to get something approved for their sick pheasants, or their net pen salmon, or I mean, it's a huge amount of variety. And I've learned a great deal. I didn't know anything about beekeeping, and now I'm pretty good. And um, it's, you really can make a difference. I've gone, we go out and do a lot of outreach. We go to the sheep producers annual convention or the game bird producers annual meeting. And we see what the actual needs are. And so we have the opportunity to help manage these incentives and work and set up these partnerships so that we actually will see something go from a need all the way through the process to a, a drug approval and something being marketed that will have an impact that is good for U.S. agriculture, it's good for our imports, it's good, our exports rather, and, um, and, that, and it's a benefit to the animals. And as a veterinarian, that's near and dear to me. And as a veterinarian, we're also concerned with public health and we want to make sure that drugs are used properly and that they are safe and people are using things that have been demonstrated to work and to be safe. So I, you know, a couple times a year we actually get something approved or listed on the index and we can point to that as an actual achievement that we have done. And I feel good about that. And I've been doing this now, I've been working minor species pretty exclusively since 1995. And it's, uh, we've gotten a lot done. There's a lot more to do. There's a lot of animals out there, but we're working on it.